So I'm, I'm sort of leaping into the, the lion's pit here today because um, when I was asked to speak, uh, uh, Michael made the mistake of asking me what I wanted to speak about instead of suggesting something. Um, and I've been speaking for the past year now about the subject of my, my book, Who Owns You? The Corporate Gold Rush to Patent Your Genes. And I'm getting kind of tired of it. Um, although this happens to be a very exciting time for this, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in relation to the lawsuits that are uh, going on and the various bills and whatnot that are sort of bringing all this to a head. Um, but I, I'm now working on the next phase of my work, and it, it's a culmination now of uh, 12 years of, uh, of work on the subject of intellectual property and philosophy. Um, and so it's a, this is an exploratory effort, and I'm interested in your reactions. Um, I'm going to start with some fundamental axioms and then give you some premises and try to work through an argument that uh, has convinced me, not just of the ethical problems related to patenting genes, but of ethical problems related to all intellectual property rights. So our first axiom, and I take these as uncontroversial, if you don't accept these axioms, then we're going to have some disagreements. We have fundamental rights to autonomy of our minds and our bodies. Okay, this is pretty standard uh, liberalism right from Mill. Axiom two, we have fundamental rights to freedom of expression consistent with Mill's liberty principle. So do I need to reiterate that principle? This, this, okay, so according to uh, J.S. Mill, uh, we have unrestricted liberty except to the extent that it injures someone else, okay? So this is the notion of the liberty principle. Okay? This is basic fundamental notion of liberal democracies. Um, and again, if you disagree, then you can just step right out. <laughs> All man-made objects intentionally produce our expressions, and these are the only subjects of IP law. Now we're going to get into a little bit of philosophy, uh, because this is not what you're used to hearing. If you study, in, who here studies intellectual property law? Uh-oh, okay. I'll watch out for you guys. Um, we, we're, you, I'm using terms a little differently than you are used to using them because, and, and this is based on my first book, and I'll explain how I mean to use these terms. Um, so my first book was uh, The Ontology of Cyberspace, and it was the culmination of my um, PhD dissertation and uh, some work I did after that. Um, and the crux of my interest in cyberspace was the puzzling problem of the simultaneous granting of patents and copyrights to the same sort of thing, right? I'm sure if all of the IP folks here understand that that's a problem because ordinarily the subjects of, in, of patent law and the subjects of copyright law are what logicians call mutually exclusive, all right? And there are, ta there are cases in, uh, leading up uh, before software that make that clear except that along comes software, which then bridges these two worlds and starts to get both patents and copyrights. So this implied to me that cyberspace is either a unique hybrid object, something entirely new, or that the categories of patent and copyright have been incorrectly drawn from the start. And guess what I conclude? Um, my conclusion uh, was that cyberspace is not some sort of new, uh, the term ontological, that's a philosophical term. It simply means, uh, well, ontology is the study of being. And I prefer to use this term over metaphysics, which sounds too much like uh, transcendental meditation or something like that. But ontology is simply the, the study of categories of being. And if we're talking about the nature of something, uh, and we're using terms that are ordinarily uh, uh, used to describe two mutually exclusive categories, and then we have a, an object that fits into those categories, we have to ask ourselves, is something wrong with the terms or is something wrong with the object? And, and my conclusion is it's not a problem of the object. It's a problem of the categories. And I looked at the history of of machinery leading up to software, essentially. And 
Does anybody know what that thing on the left-hand side is? You can guess I have a text hint. A card room. A jacquard room. And what's a jacquard room do? Uh, we use clocks based on uh, paper punches fed into a system to give a certain pattern. Exactly. So what you see here are holes on, these are not paper cards, these are big wooden slats or metal slats with holes on them in a certain pattern. And the jacquard loom uh, is an early uh, form of computer. Uh, it reads the software uh, on these big plates of metal with holes in them. Uh, and it weaves for you a pattern, uh, easing the work of uh, weavers. Um, and I say it's a matter of degree. It is a smooth spectrum between the wheel and software. All of the, cat, all of the objects in between are really the same sort of thing ontologically speaking. Uh, and I'm going to defend that a little more for you because some of you are skeptical. Um, <clears throat> This spectrum, I say, consists of, uh, on the one side, things that are primarily utilitarian, and on the other, things that are primarily uh, aesthetic. And all of the objects of intellectual property law can be categorized somewhere on that spectrum. Okay? And what are these things, then? If the categories of patent and copyright don't really describe these things accurately, <coughs> I say we can use a very common term uh, to describe exactly what they are, uh, and they are expressions. Any idea made manifest in the world is the expression of that idea. Now, we perceive these expressions for different purposes, right? The description of a, of a well you know, pump that is not going to ever uh, fill your glass of water, right? But that description is an expression of the idea of a well pump for a particular purpose, a primarily aesthetic purpose, or maybe a utilitarian purpose if it is an instruction on how to build a well pump. Okay? Um, and so I claim that th this is an example. Um, software is an example of the faulty ontology underlying intellectual property law, not because it is a new sort of object, but because it is an object that does things in a very quick way, all right? This is a text that we don't directly perceive. It is a machine whose moving parts we don't directly perceive. But the ontology of it is the same as that of a jacquard room, which is uncontroversially a machine, or a novel, which is uncontroversially an expression of a sort, of another sort. If you have questions, if you want to debate me now, uh, I'd ask that you, you, you try to write them down, hold them off, because I want to get through this. There's a lot to get through. But if you need clarification of anything along the way, I'm happy to do that. OK? So any, any clarifications at this point? Good. Our next premise, and this is also a bit of philosophy. Um, rights of ownership stem, stem from brute facts of possession and laws are just when grounded in brute facts. So recently, The Guardian reviewed uh, this book. It, it had a very favorable, favorable review, but it said, I have this quirky natural law theory, which is true. It is quirky. But I'm going to defend it for you, and uh, maybe some of you will be convinced. It's not essential to my art, um, but I, I like it. So where do property rights stem from? I claim that rights to things like land and movables which, okay, and, and I should first tell you a little bit about uh, John Searle and the notion of uh, social objects. Uh, has anybody read Construction of Social Reality? Or, no, no, it's a great book. Um, he really explains the nature of institutions, I think, quite accurately. And what he says is there's a world of brute facts. That's the pre-institutional world, right? We can think of the world without any of the legal or social conventions that we now use to understand the world. And understand that there is, before all of those institutions, there is a world of brute facts. All right, so 
Step outside your, your training and think of a world without institutional facts. And you still have objects, right? So th this is still a thing, right? And I'm still doing something with the thing. Would we call it owner, owning it? If, if we're in a pre-institutional world, am I owning this book at the moment? No, no. Ownership is an institutional fact, right? What am I doing? Holding it. Holding it and possessing it, OK? I am excluding you from holding it by my fact of possession, all right? So in a pre-institutional world, uh, we still have possessions and we still have, did you add that one? No. We still occupy space, for instance, um, and, but we don't have the, the, the uh, institutional uh, terms like ownership. I claim that the rights, the justice of laws that give us rights to property like land and movables is based upon something that, um, now this is another philosopher you, you will never have heard of, Adolf Reinach, uh, who wrote a, he was a lawyer philosopher, so dear to my heart. Um, he uh, described uh, certain sorts of institutions as grounded. Uh, and this was long before Searle talked about um, the no notion of brute facts, but he was describing the same thing. He said, um, contracts are just because they are grounded in the fact of actual agreements among people. And when people make actual agreements, something new arises in the world, an obligation and a duty, right? And that happens, according to Reinach, again, pre-institutionally. So contracts arise because of brute facts. And I say, and this, Reinach didn't talk about this, but I, I say that our, our, the justice of laws that enable us uh, to uh, exert our rights over land and movables are also ground, that's also grounded in brute facts. The brute fact of my possession of something is what makes laws that enable me uh, to sue you or the state to criminally prosecute you when you take it from me, grounded and therefore just. Okay? Questions about this? And now I have a psychological explanation for this, and that is that uh, we have created institutions that are basically uh, supposed to prevent violence, right? And prevent the use of force. So you don't have to buy that part. All you need to buy so far is that there is some justice to laws of possession uh, that we call ownership in institutions based upon something that exists pre-legally, okay? But as all of you know, and this is not, I mean, there are some even, there are some theorists who, who dispute this, but there's no way to exclusively possess the way I can, I can exclusively possess a book what we would call an expression type, All right? So the intellectual property law recognizes the distinction between types and tokens. Again, this elite, that's a philosophy, philosophy term, types and tokens, uh, describe two different real things. The novel, right, well this book, for instance, what is the token? The token is the, the actual object, right? With the particular words on pages, et cetera. The type, though, is different. And what is the type? Somebody. Anyone? The, the, the ideas, the, the particular string of words strung together in a, per, per, a certain way. So my possessing this token, what does it do to the type? Anything? Nothing, right? Because you can also possess another copy of it. You could maybe read it and memorize it and carry around in your head the the type, right? So it's a very different sort of uh, possession. Uh, and there's no way, there's just physically no way, uh, and intellectual property law, law recognizes this, to exclusively possess an expression type as opposed to the token. And any attempt by you to try to dispossess me of the type, right, by maybe reprodu reproducing it, et cetera, that's not actually going to cause violence, and it doesn't re re require force, right? Once I have expressed that type, it is out there in the world, and it doesn't do anything to my individual autonomy. Uh, you know, Peter comes up to me and he rips this book from my hand. Uh, that's 
that's a very different act than if he, you know, surreptitiously memorizes my book and then goes home and types it. Okay? Unlike land and movables, intellectual property laws are not grounded in any brute facts of possession. Okay? As I said, just laws, according to Reinach, and, and, and I agree, are grounded in brute facts. The positive law could be unjust if it conflicts with grounded laws. Now, there's all sorts of positive law that isn't grounded in any brute facts. Uh, rules about where you, you know, smoke uh, or park your car. We could argue about that, but I, I think those are, those are less clearly grounded in brute facts than uh, those of possession of movables and land. <coughs> um, but if we consider a regime that outlawed private property, right, and said private property is theft, uh, there have been such regimes. We could criticize, based on this theory so far, those regimes as being unjust. Because the justice of the rights to land and movables, I say, is grounded in brute facts. Intellectual property law is a pragmatic response to the logical problem uh, of the fact that you can't um, possess an, I uh, an idea type to the exclusion of others. And it is an attempt to try to create an economy, to try to, try to deal with this, um, to spur innovation uh, through increasing profit uh, for those who have monopolies. Okay. Any explanations required so far before the next premise? Okay. Premise three, and this is where I'm getting slightly more heretical. There are parts of the world that cannot justly be owned. And I'm going to try to defend that based on the argument I made about gene patents in this book. Um, and it has to do with this notion that if there are uh, positive laws that conflict with um, grounded rights, uh, we have to consider whether or not they are potentially unjust. And I looked at the problem of genomes. So a little, a brief introduction to the problem of gene patenting. All of you might have, there's been a lot going on here and uh, in the media about gene patents, but just a brief introduction to the question of gene patents. Um, this is a process that started uh, in the early 90s. It actually started at the NIH. So I had the great honor uh, yesterday of interviewing uh, Dr. James Watson. Anybody heard of him? Okay, the one, Watson Crick, they discovered the structure of DNA with the help, uh, and often sometimes uncredited, help of Rosalind uh, uh, Franklin and uh, Maurice Wilkins. Um, and when they discovered it, I asked, I asked Dr. Watson, well, when you, when you discovered it, um, did anybody suggest you patent it? And he looked, at, he looked puzzled and he laughed and he said, no, nobody would have thought of that. And I wouldn't have thought of that. But some unnamed Hungarian Nobel Prize winner did suggest it to him. And Watson thought this was insane and laughed it off, essentially uh, moved on and got a Nobel Prize instead. Yeah, that was a pretty good concession, uh, concession prize, actually. Um, the structure of DNA was not patented. But in the 90s, Watson was asked to head the Human Genome Project for the NIH. Now, the Human Genome Project was an international effort to develop a map of the human genome. Because if we know where, in general, genes occur on the human genome, we would be able to target um, further and future research into particular genes that we could uh, cure, you know, find for disease, disease genes and develop cures. It was a great medical project, but basically uh, the equivalent of the space race. Um, and uh, the Human Genome Project was divided into tasks that were assigned to different research centers all over the world. Uh, James Watson was in charge of the, the U.S. Uh, effort uh, when he was uh, he, he, is, he was uh, working for the NIH project uh, of the Human Genome Project at the time. Uh, and 
for the same team, uh, for Watson's team. And his name was Craig Venter. Now, you've heard of Craig Venter. And if, who hasn't heard of Craig Venter? OK. Craig Venter uh, is a very famous man. He uh, started a company called Solera. Uh, and they were going to be the private competitor to the publicly funded Human Genome Project. Um, and that, but that was much later. Um, he actually taught at the University of Buffalo, where uh, Peter, Lisa, and I are all alums of. Uh, he was in the pharm pharmacy department for a while, um, and nobody liked him that I know of. Um, <laughs> but he is a very famous man who has done great things. I don't want to detract from his greatness. And, uh, and he actually did do a lot to spur along the, 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 the race. Uh, for completing the human genome because he helped to develop a new method, a really uh, important new method to rapidly sequence genes. The whole genome shotgun method, which relies on computing power. Uh, it's a great, it's, if you're a geek, go read about it. I'm not going to describe it here. Um, but he, uh, that was a great innovation. Now, when he was working for Watson as part of the Human Genome Project in 92, he and another couple people in the, in the NIH thought, wow, when we get these things, when we find genes, and they were using, they were looking for express sequence tags, which delineate the ends of, uh, of genes, what we should do is we should file patents on these things, because they could become valuable in, in the future. James Watson, uh, well, first of all, Bernard, Bernadine Healy, uh, who was James Watson's boss at the time, thought this was a great idea. When James Watson got word of it, he bitterly complained. He, he has a temper, apparently. And he yelled and screamed that this couldn't happen. You can't do this. He was really he was just going to uh, blow a stack over this. It didn't, it didn't make him happen, in a, in a sense. Um, and when Bernadine Healy uh, discovered his unhappiness because of his very vocal uh, opposition to it, she fired him. So. Uh, he was no longer in charge of the, NAC, the, the HGP in uh, the US. Francis Collins then became the head of that. And he's now going to be head of NIH. So a little historical background to put it in perspective. Venter went on, founded a company, a private company, uh, Solera, which I already talked about. And they, as they began to sequence the human genome, guess what they did? Patented the hell out of it. So, um, they started filing patents left and right. Uh, other companies, Insight, and a couple other companies uh, really got into the act. And the short story, the, the uh, uh, short um, story of it is that today about 20% of the human genome is patented. So 20% of genes are, are have some patent claim filed on them. A gene is a, an arrangement of nucleotides that codes for a protein. Uh, and a little bit of science. It, its action involves the creation of proteins by mRNA, messenger RNA, which as it uh, creates the proteins, reads the beginning and end of the gene and leaves out the introns. Now, this is a natural process. This is how you are made. You are composed of proteins uh, that are read uh, through this process and produced in different cells according to differentiation of those cells, again, through the instructions of your DNA. It is the same mechanism as that which scientists use to create what they call isolated and purified genes, all right, cDNA. That's important. A patent on cDNA is, I argue, not different than a patent on a gene itself. There's nothing new about the cDNA. All right? That's, the, as I said, the process for creating cDNA is, is the transcription process that goes on all the time. Nature divides this. It isn't anything new. It's not novel, and it's not properly patentable. But I'm not here to make the legal argument. So don't. don't don't let's get tripped up on that, uh, because I have another argument about this that has to do with ethics. We can debate it later. Uh, my friend Luigi Palombi has an excellent book, which I recommend. It's called 
uh, gene cartels, and he really tears apart all of the legal arguments on the other side of the debate. So if any of you want to debate that, I'll ask him to step up here and uh, uh, talk about that. Let's talk about the ethics. There are two types of commons. Now this is, again, an area where we need to get clear on the terminology, because you and I, who are, we, we were trained as lawyers, and we, we think of commons as something that it turns out as, I think, a little bit oversimplified. We think of the commons as a creature of positive law, all right? that we carve out commons out of things that uh, might otherwise be ownable or possessable. Um, but that's only a, one particular type of commons, I argue. So a national park, right? National highway systems, um, international <coughs> waters. Could any of those things be enclosed and possessed to the exclusion of others? All of them could, absolutely, right? And in fact, a lot of commons, right, of those sorts, national parks, highways, etc., they have to be reclaimed from individuals, right, by the state, and then turned into a commons. That sort of commons, when you take something that could be owned and possessed, right, to the exclusion of others, um, and carve that out and, and then set it aside for the common good, that is what I'd say is a commons by choice. And I, I talk about that in chapter seven of, of my book. There's another sort of commons, and that is a commons by necessity. And this is a little trickier. Are there parts of the world that simply cannot be possessed in any meaningful way, that can't be enclosed, that can't be subject to the, remember how I described the justice, uh, the grounding of rights to possession over certain things, right? Are there parts of the universe that are unsusceptible to that sort of grounding? And I claim that there are. These are, I would say, commons by necessity. And here's a couple examples. Um, all of the oxygen in the atmosphere, OK? The element oxygen, all right? Laws of nature, bands of the radio spectrum. I like this one, because this was the one a lot of IP theorists argue about all the time. Is there any way for me to exclusively possess a band of the radio spectrum? What do you think? What can I do? If I want to exert my control over a band of the radio spectrum, I build a radio tower and I start broadcasting on a particular band. right? And then you come along and you want to exert your control over it. And what do you do? You pump up the volume. right? You turn up the wattage and then we end up with a uh, a battle, right? And this is what a lot of economists call uh, the tragedy of the commons, right? Is when everybody's fighting for uh, one of these things that uh, is supposed to be to everyone's benefit. Um, but I don't think most of the discussions account for the fact that there are these two different types of commons, and we can choose to treat them. We can choose to treat commons by choice in one way, but we have no choice over commons by necessity. Anybody have any questions about this so far? Again, we'll we can debate it after I'm done. I argue that the human genome itself is a commons by necessity. It is a constantly evolving object that involves every member of a species. And like outer space, like the atmosphere, like sunlight, like laws of nature, and like radio spectra, it cannot be enclosed to the exclusion of others simply as a matter of necessity, not as a, um, I mean, it, it's, a it's just logically impossible to conceive of this. Okay. And in fact, we prove this all the time, right? So if somebody wants to come along and reproduce a gene, what do they do? One of these 20% of the genes that are patented. <coughs> Do you have any control over your present violation of the patent law? Or you can stop yourself rec replicating, right? Yeah. And you can try to do that, and you can try not to breed, et cetera. Anyway, this un unenclosable object is constantly um, uh, uh, reproducing uh, 
genes. And uh, I argue that this is, a, this is an example, just as clear to me as uh, radio spectra, of a commons by necessity. And it isn't a pragmatic argument, okay? So this is distinct from anti-commons argument. When you think of commons, you think of the anti, because a lot of you, you know, Lawrence Les Lessig and people like that speak of the anti-commons effect. That's a pragmatic argument, right? That is not what I'm making. I'm making an ontological argument. I'm talking about the mm -hmm. nature of the thing itself. Um, so when people try to patent genes, when they do what um, Craig Venter and, uh, and others have done in trying to patent genes, they are attempting to enclose an unenclosable space to the exclusion of others. And I argue that this is an ethical wrong. But what, where does that, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, we have people from the ACLU here today as well who are courageously suing Myriad Corporation uh, for Myriad's patents on the BRCA1 and 2 genes. Um, uh, and uh, well, let me introduce them, because uh, I really think they're doing a, a great work. And, um, I saw Sandra too, right? OK. Sandra Park uh, is with the ACLU. She's an attorney on the case uh, that is uh, against Myriad. And Tanya Simoncelli. Uh, is a lead scientist on this case. So um, they are doing the right thing here because Myriad has violated not only the law, I mean, they're doing something that I approve of ethically as well, because there is an ethical problem. Myriad has attempted to possess, through patents, the BRCA1 and 2 genes, which are responsible uh, uh, for a great number of cancers. Um, and in so doing, they are trying to prevent others from uh, uh, using those genes. So they have actually sent cease and desist letters uh, to researchers uh, who were doing research on the BRCA1 and 2 genes, who were in the course of that research reproducing the genes. All right. I argue that not only is that illegal, which is Luigi's domain and Sandra's and Tanya's domain, it is unethical because this is an attempt um, to curtail our autonomy over our, our own genome. You and I have as much right to investigate what makes us up as anyone else. And this goes back to the axioms I, I explored early on in the talk. What Myriad owns through these patents is a right to exclude you from finding out about what is in you. And they're ex exercising that right to our common detriment. In fact, it does violence to you when they exercise that right, in much the same way as if Peter ripped this book from my hand. So our fourth premise. And this now goes beyond the gene argument and goes into um, new territory for me, so be gentle. IP rights are exclusionary rights that prevent the unauthorized expression of protected idea types. So I realized after I made this argument that this, the, the, the two books I've talked about so far lead me to a conclusion that I didn't realize I was going to end up having to um, accept, but which I now accept wholeheartedly. Um, <coughs> when an author or inventor owns their intellectual property, they can exclude others from making unauthorized reproductions of their expressions. Uh, they, they can receive royalties for any reproduction made, and they can enjoin the expression, and can prevent the expression by others of that idea type. Okay, that's basic intellectual property law. Now we allow for all sorts of restrictions on our expressions, right? Consistent with Mill's liberty principle, and what was that again? where that expression injures another, does some injury. So typically, uh, when the law says you can't make a certain expression, it has to do with uh, preventing a physical harm or incitement to some physical harm. And I've come to the conclusion that all intellectual property law <coughs> is a, some form of government restriction on expression having nothing to do with physical harms or incitement. 
And in fact, all expressed ideas belong to the category of commons by necessity, as there is no meaningful way of possessing or enclosing them. So besides the ethical problems of governmentally curtailing free expression, I say that intellectual property law as a category of law is an attempt to enclose a commons by necessity, just like laws that allow for the patenting of genes. IP rights prevent the free use of expressed ideas, which are commons by necessity, just as much as radio waves are, just as much as the element oxygen is, genes and laws of nature. And IP laws do, in general, what gene patents do. They prevent you from using something that is a commons by necessity. And if the positive law violates something grounded, as I've argued before, then it is unjust. And so my conclusion is, that our shared rights to commons by necessity are grounded in the brute facts of their unenclosability and attempts to curtail our, our access to that commons by necessity are similarly unjust. So, you know, there's this old uh, aphorism that ideas want to be free, but that's a little too glib. They just, they are. Once they are expressed, once they are made manifest into the world, expressions are simply free. And attempts to enclose them are morally wrong, as attempts to enclose genes, sunlight, oxygen, or other commons by necessity are. And so that is my radical uh, conclusion. I didn't expect to reach it when I started investigating uh, intellectual property law about 12 or 13 years ago. But um, that's where my work has taken me. And I would ask you to consider, for instance, uh, there's a ton of examples we can talk about. Perhaps this is fodder for our discussion now. Um, but I want to thank you for listening. <laughs> Bodies. OK, this is pretty standard uh, liberalism right from Mill. Axiom two, we have fundamental rights to freedom of expression consistent with Mill's liberty principle. So do I need to reiterate that principle? Okay. So according to uh, J.S. Mill, uh, we have unrestricted liberty except to the extent that it injures someone else. Okay. So this is the notion of the liberty principle. This is a basic fundamental notion of liberal democracies. Um, and again, if you disagree, then you can just step right out. <laughs> All man-made objects intentionally produced are expressions, and these are the only subjects of IP. It's a culmination now of uh, 12 years of, uh, of work on the subject of intellectual property and philosophy. Um, and so it's a, this is an exploratory effort, and I'm interested in your reactions. Um, I'm going to start with some fundamental axioms and then give you some premises and try to work through an argument that uh, has convinced me, not just of the ethical problems related to patenting genes, but of ethical problems related to all intellectual property rights. So our first axiom, and I take these as uncontroversial, if you don't accept these axioms, then we're going to have some disagreements. We have fundamental rights to autonomy of our minds and our so I'm, I'm sort of leaping into the, the lion's pit here today because um, when I was asked to speak, uh, uh, Michael made the mistake of asking me what I wanted to speak about instead of suggesting something. Um, and I've been speaking for the past year now about the subject of my, my book, Who Owns You? The Corporate Gold Rush to Patent Your Genes. And I'm getting kind of tired of it. Um, although this happens to be a very exciting time for this, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in relation to the lawsuits that are uh, going on and the various bills and whatnot that are sort of bringing all this to a head. Um, but I, I'm now working on the next phase of my work in a, of patents and copyrights to the same sort of thing, right? I'm sure if all of the IP folks here understand that that's a problem 
because ordinarily the subjects of, in, of patent law and the subjects of copyright law are what logicians call mutually exclusive. All right, and there are ta there are cases in, uh, leading up uh, before software that make that clear. Except that along comes software, which then bridges these two worlds and starts to get both patents and copyright. So this implied to me that cyberspace is either a unique hybrid object, something entirely new, the law. Now we're going to get into a little bit of philosophy uh, because this is not what you're used to hearing. If you study, in, who's here studies intellectual property law? Uh, okay. I'll watch out for you guys. Um, we, we're, you, I'm using terms a little differently than you are used to using them. Because, and, and this is based on my first book, and I'll explain how I mean to use these terms. Um, so my first book was uh, The Ontology of Cyberspace, and it was the culmination of my um, PhD dissertation and uh, some work I did after that. Um, and the crux of my interest in cyberspace was the puzzling problem of the simultaneous granting 